without a bar. Welcome to 3 PNR. I'm your host, Adamar, and joining me again is Raymond Schmansky. How are you doing, Raymond? Awesome. Good to be here again. Thanks for having me. Good, good. We were just talking a moment ago about you being in Florida, in the Tampa area. True. Yeah. You know, I learned something new, by the way, in the last month. Uh, Jackie Gleason, with the permission of, of our former president, Richard Nixon, was able to go to McDill Air Force Base and, and observe craft and bodies. Do you ever hear about that? Yeah, uh, you had the right two guys, but you had the wrong Air Force Base. Oh, I don't know why I thought they said the McDill Air Force Base on one of those things I just watched. No, um, Jackie Gleason lived in Miami, right? so it was Homestead Air Force Base. Ah, yeah, I thought that weird. I'll have to share the link with you. I swear in this link they said they said McDill, but you know what? Uh, you're the second person to say that to me that was actually Miami. Well, I'm the second person to be right today. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to be honest. It makes more sense because McDill's, you know, it's if you see where D McDill's located here in Tampa, it's surrounded by everything. So it's really kind of hard to have any secrecy go on there. Nixon um, was also a Miami person. He hung around. He had a lot of financial backers from there, uh, mostly shady people. But, uh, yeah, he was tightly connected to Miami. Yeah. And Miami in that era, <laughs> that's, uh, it was the Wild West. So yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that what Jackie Gleason said was true, but he believed it, and he told his wife, and then she told everybody. So who knows? Uh, we will probably never know the truth of that. Yeah, the only the, the person they were speaking again, it was in third party. It wasn't like his friend's actual friend. It was someone speaking in the behest of his friend, saying that he seemed really distraught about this information. So I don't know. I guess some people handle it differently. Well, his wife went on record as saying, you know, I didn't want to tell anybody till after his death. And he swore by his story. And apparently, you know, th after their first encounter, after it happened, she said he was like white as a ghost. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I could see that, especially in an era where your belief system is like, you know, God made here and that, that's it. There's here. And then you find out something like that. It's a it's a huge shock to the system. I can imagine. So we're going to talk about, let's open up with your book, Swamp Gas, My Ass. <laughs> I still love this title. Speak For those who hadn't read it or, or hadn't heard of it yet, uh, speak about what it what is in the book and what they could discover in it. Well, it's a lot of um, Air Force history, U.S. government history, and UFO history all coming together because in March of 1966, for about three weeks, southeastern Michigan, which included cities like Ann Arbor, of course, you know, home of University of Michigan, uh, Mount Clemens, which hosted Selfridge Air Force Base at the time, which was the home of the 71st Fighter Interceptor Squadron, which was our first defense against Russian bombers coming over the Arctic Circle with nuclear bombers down to Canada and then, you know, bombing New York and Philly and all those places. Um, so you had um, major important locations like you had Dexter, Michigan, Hillsdale, we'll get into it. But for three weeks, flying saucers were flying around and they weren't being reported just by the average Joe citizen. Most of the early reports that were coming in to the police station were the police themselves because they're out on patrol, you know, they're watching the skies for airplanes and they're watching the streets, you know, it's midnight till 5 a.m., the dark time. And so these lights, these very unusual lights, and in some cases the lights became actual flying saucers where the guy said, yeah, it was 100 feet over my head, you know, it was 50 feet wide, it had these lights. But for three weeks, these reports were coming in and it got so much attention that Gerald Ford, the future United States president and several of the other representatives of that area, their offices were inundated with phone calls. So the, these people, which it started with future president Ford, he called project blue book in Dayton, Ohio at Wright Patterson, where I worked for 40 years. And he said, you guys are the UFO investigation arm of the U S government. Send your experts in here. So they sent, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, and he was the, quote, 
scientific consultant. He wasn't reality a debunker for the U.S. Air Force, but that's another story. So he came in, he talked to some of the witnesses, and he cherry-picked the information because he didn't have a good explanation to explain it away. But a couple of these sightings were in wooded areas. So they came up with what is now a famous excuse, swamp gas. Yeah, you know, I've looked at videos and images of swamp gas, and I don't see how they're confusing these things. Swamp gas is pretty low lying, right? And it's 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 not it doesn't it definitely doesn't you know race around the sky as most people witness. It certainly doesn't show uh, aerial ability. I'm not sure what, what that sounds like a a very strange maybe because most people weren't aware what swamp gas is, and when he explained it in their words, maybe that that could do something. I don't know. I don't know how they got the different how they got to that. Well, I know I'll tell you how they got to that, and then we'll get back to the book. Okay. Dr. Dr. Heineck had friends at the University of Michigan, and when he came on what we call TDY, temporary duty, that's what we called it in the government, he, and he was being paid by the government, he came TDY or temporary duty to Ann Arbor. Instead of staying at a hotel, he stayed at the home of a University of Michigan astronomy professor who was a personal friend. and. For the three nights he was there, and every night he was there, that university professor would have the entire faculty of the astronomy department, plus other professors, show up at his house at night, and they have these long table discussions with Dr. Hynek. And during one of those early discussions, some biology professor said, have you heard of swamp gas? And that's where that explanation came from. Ah. So Hynek had nothing. And after the third day, there was so much pressure, the Secretary of Defense and senatorial representatives like Gerald Ford were calling the office back at Wright Pad saying, we need an answer. We need it now. We want to prevent panic. So on um, the, the 25th of um, March, 1966, they held a massive press conference at the Detroit Press Club. And it's there that they unveiled the swamp gas explanation. It's, but my book is the truth. And that truth is, in March of 1966, there were so many calls coming in that it's called the control center, the air control center, air defense control center in Battle Creek, Michigan, had gotten so many calls and sightings filtered to it that they decided to scramble two jets out of Selfridge Air Force Base, which is about 45 miles due east of the location where most of the sightings were. About 54 years after the incident, I uncovered the pilot who in March of 1966 was scrambled into a jet out of Selfridge Air Force Base, an F-106, and intercepted the UFO over southeastern Michigan. Huh. Well, and what? What in speaking to him? Obviously, before we even get to that, fighter pilots are professional observers. That's their job is to identify a threat and either eliminate it or monitor it. So this guy's not going out there and, and doing a roundabout like, oh, what if or maybe, and definitely not swamp gas. So what he's seeing is what he's what he claims is what he saw. I mean, it's. He's not going to. He's not going to fabricate. By by that time, uh, he was an advanced captain, soon to be major, and he had over two thousand hours flying in fighter jets. Oh. So his job, as you said, was to identify things in the sky. So they scramble him, and they scramble him with um, his wingman. So I asked him. You know, I did this through over 30 hours of interviews where I sat down at his table, got my cell phone out, put it on video and had it in a little holder and then asked him questions. So everything we did is recorded for posterity. And then I used transcripts of those interviews as the heart and soul of the book. What they did in March of 1966 is they went out there and about 30 minutes after being vectored around that part of the state, they actually got this is the, the, the Colonel Carroll. He retired as a full board colonel. And um, Nicholson, who was his um, 
wingman, Robert Nicholson, they each saw it visually and they communicated to each other on the comms. Do you see it? Yeah, I see it. It's at, you know, one o'clock or, you know, wherever it is. Uh, it's, it's making a bend. Yeah, I got it. Okay, what are we going to do? And then you got it on radar. They each got it on their radar. So not only could they see it, but intermittently the blips from that target were showing up. So it's a confirmation and the radar, the ground radar is catching it. So, uh, and there are ground observers. So you've got this quad reporting system going on. Um, they chase it around for about 45 minutes. They've got it on visual several times and then it decides, well, I'm done toying with y'all. And it does a 90 degree turn to their left and just disappears like, you know, they're doing Mach 2 and this thing heads out at Mach 20. You know, I wonder how much of that is exactly what you said. Maybe not toying, but exercising their ability to just do what they want when they want. You know, uh, maybe conveying a message like you could you could come track me down all you want, but that's the best you're going to get is some some small glimpses because their capabilities are so much greater. What kind of effect did it have on these pilots? Like, did it? I imagine it's not just a profound effect, but professionally, I imagine when they're in the air for that, they're looking around a little bit more. I am intent to find something more, right? Is that, did it have, would you think it has that sort of effect? Um, yes, it did. And he told me about the effect. That's all covered in the book. But I think the most substantial thing is actually what I use right on the first page of the book. And he basically said, up until that moment, I had never seen a UFO. But once I did, that changed everything for me i hear that a lot i hear that a lot i hear people you know raymond i haven't witnessed anything right and i i had someone say the same thing to me once you do it's it's going to become more it's going to occur more in your life i'm like well how would that be the case but then i hear that from a lot of people once they've seen these or or they're maybe it's their perception all right we see it now they're aware we see it and so i don't know maybe that opens your perception differently i am guilty of something I don't walk around intentively looking up or searching, nor am I a trained observer, right? So when I eventually go out to do a documentary, I have to alter a lot of things about myself. Well, he said that um, when he wasn't in combat, because he spent, after that, he spent time in Vietnam, spent 12 months in Vietnam, flew over 300 missions. So think about that in 12 months. So he's averaging almost a mission a day. Flew over 300 missions. He said when he's in combat, he's not, he definitely did not think about that. But when he was doing other training or he was in the sky and they were doing patrols, he said that was always on his mind that, you know, he'd hoped that maybe under less intense conditions that he could re-engage one because when they got this, it was, oh, you know, they spotted it in the sky. You know, they had it. Uh, they were chased it for maybe 60 seconds. Now, think about this. At Mach 2, 60 seconds is a very long time. Right. And so they have it, you know, and then, uh, then you know, it blinks out. And then, you know, the radar response. And they got it on radar for 60 seconds. And then, you know, the thing comes back in the visual. And at one point, he said, the thing stopped in the sky. Like, to catch, come on and catch me. He said it literally, it appeared to him. He said, now, obviously, if the thing is doing Mach 4, he's doing Mach 2, and it slows to, you know, Mach 1, then, and he's still doing Mach 2. He said, well, I'm going to gain on it quickly, and it's going to look like it's in the, hanging in the sky like a helicopter. But he said, I have a lot of experience with that. And to me, at one point, it looked like he just stopped in the sky to wait for us. Wow. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, damn, like what, as you, a fighter, that's got to make you feel a little insecure, right? You're a, you're a pilot in a fighter jet. You're, you're the, at that time, the most advanced thing in the air. And then something toys you, that's really got to make you feel pretty, pretty insecure. I imagine. I, I would, I would, I would feel like there's this thing where all through history, any military, uh, training or if there's wars there's always been something with ufology attached to it uh, like the foo fighters and prior to that 
I was even reading about some of the Civil War stuff where they were saying they were seeing, um, what did they describe that as again? Like, like, like almost like large lights in the distance. Um, you know, this is, I don't know. Like orbs. Yeah. Like, how do you deny, how do you explain these things? Like, it's all, other than my thought is that they're definitely observing our military because that's what we would do, right? If we're going to study a planet of, of intelligent creatures, well, we would want to monitor how they evolve. And certainly their their energy and certainly their their military, those are the two things we definitely pay attention to, to see how they're evolving. I, in, in the time you had to speak with him, did he ever express any kind of fear or no? No. Uh, he said that, unfortunately, he was up there to get answers. Um, it did not, for example, show up on their infrared system. And when they're flying this 106, they have the best radars in the world and the best infrared system in the world, the best everything in the 106. In fact, the 106 was such a fabulous jet. It was in the inventory for like 20 some years as a fighter jet. And that's just kind of unheard of. Right. But he said that because it was on his radar for um, such a short period of time intermittently, and it didn't show up on IR, it, it, it generated more questions like, you know, this, this guy is a fighter, so he, a fighter pilot, so he's trained uh, in his classes in, in aeronautical physics and, and, and all those sort of things. So they're dealing with heat-seeking missiles. And he said that a body in the atmosphere at you know, 8,000 feet and he's going Mach 2 and this other thing is going, you know, Mach 20. He said it would have to have generated a heat signature yet because it's it looked metal to him. But he said there wasn't a hint of a heat signature on the infrared. And that was puzzling to him. So not only could this thing stop in midair and just accelerate to, to you know, 20, uh, uh, Mach 20, uh, in a in an instant, but that the finest equipment in the world, which should easily have been able to detect him, couldn't. And when it did on regular radar, it was only intermittently. It was like he said it, it acted as if um, when somebody's employing electronic warfare, they've got your signal and they go, "Oh, okay, I got their signal. I see their frequency hopping. I'm going to." grab this, regenerate it, and jam it down their throat, and it's basically going to blank out their radar. And he said that's what it reminded him of. It's like uh, they took 60 seconds to recognize that, oh, these guys are on us, their radar is working, and then, boom, they did something just to shut it off. Yeah, you know. So it was, it was, it was puzzling. Yeah, it's per it, I'm perplexed by it. I'll tell you why, because I, I recently saw another video. I mean, I'm diving into ufology pretty not not new. I've always been fascinated, but at the beginning of this podcast is when I really started diving. And before the beginning, anyway, a few months I did a lot of research. I found a video of the Mexican Air Force with, where they, I guess they thought they were uh, looking for drug smugglers. And right. on, the, on their FLIR cameras, you saw these these lights cruising at uh, above the clouds, and in and in uh, they were organized and moving pretty rapidly. And that was a long time ago. And I do remember seeing those videos years ago. I just never gave really a strong amount of attention to them. But now, you know, given all I've learned, it makes me wonder why we didn't take more notice. Or or, or are we like that at people? Like, like that's fascinating. Oh, my God. Back to what I'm doing. I mean, are we at that point? Is that what's going on? Because it's, it's crazy. For There's people, Raymond, there are people that still think UFOs do not exist after military videos released, let alone the a crazy amount of evidence over the years, right? A substantial amount. But even, but after the, the videos from the, the military, how do you at least not acknowledge that if nothing else? That blows my mind. I think the biggest mind blower was the 25 June 2021 Office of the Director of National Intelligence nine page report that was released. And for the listeners out there who aren't familiar with this, there was a bill that was signed by President uh, Trump before he left office, which gave 120 days for the intelligence and, and Department of Defense community to come up with a report for Congress and tell them all that they knew about UFOs and extraterrestrials. And so it actually came out in two pieces. There was a highly classified briefing that was given in person to Congress 
selected individuals. And then there was a nine page unclassified report that came to you, I, and all the normal citizens. And to summarize for your listeners, this is what it said effectively. One, flying saucers are real. They are not imaginary. Two, whatever they are, are definitely a safety of flight hazard. And three, whatever they are, they are potentially a matter of national security. So here you have the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the agency that, that wraps itself around all intelligence information, and they said flying saucers are real. Now, unfortunately, you know, we're in the middle of COVID, and we're in the middle of um, the new administration coming in and doing just the, the craziest stuff, you know. Yeah, whatever Close it is they pipe. do. <laughs> really, nil. So, so in an ordinary year, without all this COVID and, and people being sequestered and, you know, the, the new administration coming in and doing un, inexplicable things, that would have made a worldwide ripple. Agreed. But people were hiding out in their homes wondering where their next roll of toilet paper is coming from. Yeah, that's weird. And, and, yeah, it, and it's what? the start of the summer travel season. So all of this stuff combined pushed that. I mean, they had one news cycle and it disappeared. Yeah, you know, you're right about that. That didn't really get in the news. It was more displayed on like podcast and like, you know, uh, you know, small media, like like social media outlets. But you're right. It didn't get much play in the news after that initially. I wonder why that is. Well, because there were too many other things that sell newspapers. And uh, I think that the media, for the most part, I'm going to just, I'm going to throw out a number because I'm not an expert in this, but I'm pretty well versed. 95% of the media went along with the government's way of doing things, sometimes because they were threatened. They were told, like in the Roswell case, the radio station was told, I think it was KGFL, was told, if you play this Roswell information that this rancher gave you, we're going to pull your license. Now, that's not unprecedented. That's, that's gone on for decades. Or, or you know, many, many um, newspapers, magazines had intelligence people inside working for them, making sure that stories had the laugh factor in them rather than being put out as, as factual. So the media has been complicit now for three quarters of a century. And for them to come out and give this thing widespread, um, you know, advertisement makes them look bad for the most part. Because now we could go turn on them and go, hey, this is what we've been telling you for 75 years. What gives? You know, this right. just proves, you know, this, this proves a lot of bad things. And so, you know, it, it proves their guilt. So, of course, you know, they certainly don't want to do that. Yeah, it's and, you know, there's the other thing, too. There's a lot of irresponsible content makers that they will take nonsense clips and nonsense photos and they will blast it out there as real. And what ends up happening is when something tangible comes along, it gets lumped into the same category as a nonsense. And it drives me nuts. I, you know, I'm, I, they've gotten me a few times, right? I'll see it. I'll scroll. I'll see it. I'll click on it. And about three minutes, either to reading or watching, I, I know right away, like they got me. I, I was taken. And what happens is, is like real stories come out like David Fravor and, and people just put hit that story in the same category as the nonsense they've been reading. And that's, I think that's a problem. It's an, it's an irresponsible, there's no uh, fault for people to say, Hey, this is fiction and I'm making this for entertainment. They don't, they need to separate those two worlds uh, because otherwise we're going to have this problem for a long time, or at least until private industry goes to space and they find something and Jeff Bezos wants to turn another billion on some channel watching these things up close. Who knows? <laughs> so there you go. He's, he's going to have his own films, but you're right. The Navy guys came out. Hooray for them. The Air Force probably has similar videos, but they didn't come out because protecting the sky is the Air Force's problem. And the Navy's like, hey, we don't mind 
putting these out there because it's not going to be our problem. It's going to be the Air Force's problem. Yeah. And boof, there you go. And the Air Force is going, damn it, guys. You know, we've got all this and they do. The Air Force has got tons of stuff, but they didn't release it because it's like, we've got enough problems. You know, we, we're, we're, you know, in Slap Janice Stan and we're, you know, we're doing this and we've got real live wars and, and we just don't have time to mess with these things that, well, they're not firing on us and they're not dropping bombs and, you know, just forget about them, guys. It's swamp gas. And, and you know, the, the Navy's like, ah, I got you, Air Force. Now, now the problem's out and it's all yours. Yeah, you know, that's that's another huge factor too, right? It's it's pawning it off in the next acronym. You deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I'm making fun of the situation, but it's a reality. Yeah. I mean, it's, well, it's true. Like, I mean, you look how the, uh, some of these three-letter, four-letter acronyms in, uh, in the world of national security play games, right? Uh, it's scary. Like, not to not to bring it up, but I heard 9-11 could have been avoided, or at least that's what I read. And it's because of, you know, uh, compartmentalization. They didn't communicate with other acronyms. And one guy's information is not as good as the next guy's. That could translate to a lot of things, especially with ufology. Because I'm sure there's some top people that take this very seriously. Like an example, Lou Elizondo, he, I don't, my impression is that he's not pleased that these are in our atmosphere and we're not doing more about it. Seems like he's discouraged by that. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, but I think I think he wants too much too soon. Now it took seventy five years to get somebody in power to admit that these things are real, and uh, Lou is certainly you know the man of the hour for doing it. But you know you can't ask for solutions that aren't there. You know, and now I go back to Colonel Gary Carroll, who was the hero of Swamp Gas My Ass, and you know we got a chance after the book was out and, you know, chit chat once in a while, just casually about what's next and, and about guys like uh, Elizondo and guys like Mellon and, and uh, everybody, you know, who was to the stars Academy who came out and just looked really iffy. It looked like a, it looked like just a quest to, to, you know, pump money into a production company. And it turned out it totally wasn't, you know, just because they had the guy from, you know, Blink uh, yeah. 182, you know, uh, heading up uh, the thing and using his uh, fame to, to draw attention to it. So I don't really think Lou should be really disappointed at all. I think, man, he did more than anybody in the last 75 years. So if I was Lou, I, would, I wouldn't push it. I'd let, I'd let this run its course for a year and see – you know, what direction the government's going to take this in and, and offer myself as, you know, meaning Lou, as a consultant to go, hey, you know, I got my finger on the pulse of the public. And I think I think this is the direction they'd like to see you go in. Yeah. You know, also to that note, Tom DeLong, Blink-182, people say he's crazy, but he's not. I've never seen him produce any, like, we'll, we'll call it bullshit. You, you know, I, I've never seen a guy go public and say, you know, anything that this is a fact, like this guy's digging for facts and he'd surround himself by a team of very serious and professional people to do that. You don't see him throwing around a bunch of pop. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen him on social media publicizing or, or stating anything about ufology that, that seemed mythical at all. <laughs> so I wonder why people throw that dirt on him. I think what he did is like you said, it was really intelligent. He's got fame. He's got wealth surrounded himself with, with professionals that are looking into the subject, Lou being one. And it was, uh, now you can't, in other words, Lou's going to come out and he's going to say what he's going to say. And so some of these other professionals and because of the celebrity of Tom DeLong, people take notice. They have to, I think, uh, you know, my hat's off to Tom DeLong, man. He, he really, he's, he's, he's invested. And like I said before, I'd never heard him speak bullshit ever. Like I, he, it's like he, he wants facts. And then, and then the other thing about him too, I've never, if he's, if there's something he doesn't know, he just says, I don't know. Or I won't, or he just says, I can't say because he really can't. He has, he has an obligation to the the team he's with not to speak about things until they're all in agreement of it. So yeah, I, I, I'm a fan of, uh, to the stars Academy. I really am. I, I applaud there, what they're doing. There, there's an adage. If you, if you can't kill the message, kill the messenger. And, and then what you found is, is that, the, the bunkers out there, and paid the bunkers and, and paid skeptics, the people that are supposed to cover this up, 
I realized that now the opposition had changed because the government was listening. The government was no longer on their side. At worst, the government was in the middle. And so you saw all these bad stories come out about DeLong and El Zondo and Chris Mellon. Yeah. And, and it, it becomes clear at that point when you start to see that happen, you realize, ah, they can't kill the message. So they're doing what they've done before. And they'll put out all kinds of untrue bad things so that people will doubt the message from the messenger. So, you know, I just give a heads up to your listeners out there that, you know, when they start to see that being done from somebody who's trying to put something controversial out there, it's the the paid guys, the paid debunkers and whatever, trying to tamp the story down and killing the, the messenger. Yeah. And you know, also for people listening, what he just said about what they're, you know, throwing dirt in their name, essentially this same thing. We do this to other regime leaders and other governments all the time. It's called propaganda. We do this. We, we, we sow the seed of nonsense with their name and start calling their character in a question to crumble their, their empire regime or their government. So usually when you see someone coming with information and then the people, like you said, people are like, trying to throw dirt in her name. It's because something in that message uh, it rang true. And now we got to undo the person. So that's a good, I'm glad you said, brought that up. It's a good point. I mean, then we back to swamp gas, right? That's what we did. Well, let's use this. It, wasn't it that Heineck, didn't he like regret or something like that? Like he, he was very regretful. Some of the statements he made during that time. Well, the Air Force called him a scientific consultant, and he had a PhD in astrophysics, I believe. And, you know, he was a learned man, very sharp. But his job publicly was to investigate these sightings, what his real job was and what he admitted to later in writing and in interviews was his real job was to disinterest the public in all of these things, and especially those that were the highest profile. Now, what regrets did he have? Well, when the Air Force canceled his contract and said, we're canceling Project Blue Book, we no longer need a debunker, a consultant, because we don't have to answer the questions, Heineck flipped instantaneously because he was no longer obligated to debunk the truth. And so he formed the Center for UFO Studies, QFOS, which instantaneously, Heineck knew how to make a buck. And in writing, he said, they asked him, why did you do this? And he said, well, I had to think about getting my kids to college and I needed the money. So he did it for money and he admitted it. And he said, when the Air Force made up their mind that UFOs, flying saucers did not exist, woe be the person who went against that. Huh. So he admitted. And so he, he made up swamp gas. He made up weather balloon. He made up Venus. He made up all the best he could because the government said, your job is not to investigate. Oh, you can go out there and you can take photos and soil samples. But when it's all said and done, flying saucers do not exist. I mean, the man put this in writing in his later years. He was unafraid to admit it. So, a lot of people made him out to be a hero. Oh, no, he, he, you know, and, and their, their, their explanation for his transition was he saw the light. <laughs> no bullshit. He didn't see the light. He saw the fact that one paycheck was ending and he needed to get a new paycheck. And he got a new paycheck by founding QFOS. It's simple. History will prove this out. You know, so you're right yeah. because this other guy I'm looking into, I'm trying to track this guy down, Richard Doty. All right. Yeah. This guy was a misinformation guy for the military or for for the government for quite a while. In yes. fact, he some disturbing things I've I've learned about him. Disturbing. Yes. And then somewhere he on the other side he's pro, like not, I'm not going to say pro UFO, but every documentary I see him in it's he's speaking as if yes, they're real and yes it's happened, like he's pro UFO, but his agenda was really a different agenda prior. So kind of the same thing. He like flips sides for whatever's going to benefit him because I'm sure he's getting paid handsomely to go on some of these documentaries, right? Um, you know, I was in Ancient Aliens. I was in an episode of Ancient Aliens called, the episode title was Area 52. Okay. 
So if you go to the if you go to Ancient Aliens, look up streaming, go to the thing called Area 52, the episode. I'm right at about the 29 minute mark. So um, they flew me to LA. They put me up for a nice hotel for for uh, three days. They got me a rental car. They gave me some per diem for food, and they gave me a small what we'll call honorarium, which non disclosure agreement. I can't tell you exactly right. how much, right? But I can tell you that um, you can't make a living that way. So maybe if you know, I had five other documentaries right. that I was going to film in those couple of days, I might have made some profit. But here is the thing about Doty: you're absolutely correct. Uh, Doty was a member of the OSI at Kirtland Air Force Base, and um, there's a book that you need to read. It's about a man by the name of Paul Benowitz and, and Doty and his ilk were responsible for Benowitz basically taking his own life because of the, the, the things that they did with Paul Benowitz. And now Doty is out there telling everybody, yeah, I was part of the OSI and yeah, we, we um, gave you this disinformation. And then here's where it gets sketchy. He's saying, Here's some of the disinformation we put out there. Here's how we did it, et cetera, et cetera. My take is this. He's still a disinformation yes. specialist. I was just going to say. And, and, and the way he's operating, I know, I saw, I saw him live. We both spoke at the same conference in 2019. I actually confronted him uh, while he was on stage from the audience during the Q&A session. Huh. And yeah. Doty is now spinning the stuff, but the way I think he's doing it is he's taking credit for putting information out there that's true, but now he's trying to put blue smoke and mirrors around it yep. because some of what he said is actually factual and it's being used to prove stuff when people go way back. So I think he's still in his disinformation role. Who's funding him? I don't know, but I do know that he's like an inside guy when he was on stage and it was q a i ran literally ran from my chair to be <laughs> the first to be the first one to ask him the question and it, it's probably it would be on video had they not lost the video for the entire conference i ran up to him and i said considering what your occupation was and your well-documented history of disinformation how can we believe a single word out of your mouth today or going forward? And his response was, well, I knew someone was going to ask that question. And then he babbled on and he never answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a common thing, right? It's speaking in circles. You know, I'm going to tell you, man, every documentary I've seen him in so far, he speaks with no pause. It's he's pre-programmed for what he's saying. I guarantee that he's he's he rehearsed very well, which is why I want to reach out to him. And I'm going to get him on the show because I'm not going to, and I'm not going to throw him in a corner and ban, you know beat him into submission. I want to ask him my questions and I want to hear his real responses. Uh, but he's proven tough to get to. He's got he's got a lot of gatekeepers. One way or the other, I'm going to get to him. But you know, to your point, like how do you <laughs> how do you digest things he says now? Yeah, even it's so weird. To admit. I, yeah, I don't, don't waste, don't, don't waste your time. Clearly do not waste your time. If you're trying to learn, I mean, if you're trying to learn about professional debunkers, then go for it and read the book about Paul Benowitz. Um, uh, let me, while, while we're doing this in real time. Okay. And this, this might be helpful. You can edit if you need to. No, no, good book about Paul Benowitz. What's the, uh, what's the title of it? That's what I'm going for oh, okay. right now. Here's what I found. It's called project beta. Project Beta. Yeah. And what happened is, for you and your readers, Paul Benowitz had a home which overlooked Kirtland Air Force Base, and he was an electronics intercept expert. And his equipment had picked up some strange signals coming out of Kirtland Air Force Base. He literally looked down onto the base from his home, and Paul Benowitz fought that what he was um, intercepting because he, he didn't understand the signals because they were very different than what he dealt with. And he was a world-class professional in signals intelligence. He thought he was intercepting 
intergalactic communication. Hmm. And when the counterintelligence people, when Paul Benowitz contacted the base to tell them that he thought that aliens were trying to contact Kirtland, they realized that Benowitz had stumbled upon an experiment that was emanating signals that normally nobody would have intercepted, but Paul with his equipment was. And so it was the counterintelligence people like Doty to take Benowitz off the trail. And if you read Project Beta, it's fascinating how sophisticated of an operation they pulled on Paul Benowitz. It's mind blowing. I read that I read that book decades ago. Project Beta. All right, I love Project that. Beta. You got to read it. You got to read it before you you uh, interview Doty. If I to. if if I interviewed, I, I plan to talk to a couple of. I, you know, I had an argument with a skeptic the other day. Um, he, he his and his real argument it wasn't even like science based, right? It was like, well, if there's UFOs and and go, they need to prove it to us. I'm like, okay, well, you're saying it's not real. You need to prove that to me. <laughs> same, you know, same side of the coin, man. You can't. It's not fair to ask someone. To, to hand you proof of the existence when you should be out there doing the same if you're so passionate about it and you call yourself a skeptic, be responsible. Go out there and do the, do the, do the, your due diligence. Do the work. Find the find the proof that it's not real. You know, put the time. It's, it's not fair to point a finger and say, no, nope, crazy, without you doing, you know. It's like being in, in a court of law. There's two attorneys, one to prosecute, the other one to defend. Both of them have to do the same amount of work to prove their case. And that's the way it should be. You can't... I heard a skeptic, uh, I don't even remember which one it was. I was reading this on, a, on an article. Said that the uh, the things that the uh, military recorded, the, the, the gimbal video, was it another jet. And I'm like, are you? There was the go fast, there was the go fast, the gimbal, yeah. and the tic tac. You're in, I mean, this guy's insulting po fighter pilots. These are trained professionals who locked it with sophisticated equipment. It's an irresponsible thing, and it's an insult to tell them that that's a jet. You're, you're basically saying, that our, our best of our best that are flying these, these planes are what buffoons? Oh my God! Stop it! If you want to be if you want to be an naysayer, do the work, do real work too. No, don't just sit there and try to. Well, you know, it looks like it could be this. That's as good as a guy saying that it could be whatever he thought it was. It's not fair, you know. So, yeah, Richard Doty. If I get him, the questions I'm going to ask him, I'm going to have to really. I have a list I've compiled for him and mostly are going to be speaking to his character and, and some of the things he says to be true. And then I'll make an assessment from there, but I want to be able to hear the mind of a skeptic and, a, and someone to misinformation firsthand. So I could understand it better. Cause he, he's not, he's not a skeptic. He was a professional counterintelligence agent and right. debunker. So you're, you're not just dealing with a skeptic and, and back to your previous point. Um, at the very end of the book, I asked Colonel Carroll, this is, you know, we've done over 30 hours. We've done months and months of interviews and then creating the book and drafts that I let him redline and boy, did he ever, because he's a former boss, man. He's a former Colonel. And at the very end, one of the last questions I ever asked him, I said, you know, there are people out there that are going to say, uh, this didn't happen and that didn't happen. What would you say to those people? And he said, well, what I would say to them is I was there. That guy wasn't. Who are you going to believe? A and that's that's the simplest way that you can answer these debunkers is by saying, you know what? I got to side with that guy because he was there and you weren't. And and that will that will end all discussion right there. Yeah. Well, what I did to this guy, and I think you'll appreciate this. I was like, "How do you know UFOs aren't real?" And he's like, oh, I just I don't see them ever." I'm like, so so on your FLIR and and your IR and all your other sophisticated equipment, you know, someone he goes, "No, I don't own that stuff." I'm like, I'm talking about the military. That's what they saw it through. Right? Like, <laughs> you mean to tell me that what they're seeing is not real based on what you your belief system? That's not good enough. That's not science. You can't take that to court, man. It's not fair. So here's like, go, go ahead. Here's a question I got for you, or actually, you phrased it to me, and I, and I and it made me take pause for a minute and think. What do researchers, TV, radio, and podcasters want from this? 
That's a great question. I know what I do. I want facts. I'm desperate to learn. So, but there's a lot out there and you're right about this. When you state, when you phrased it, you hear them adding that little bit of something to it to make it, you know, more appealing. And I'm not trying to do that. And I'm sure I'm going to, people are like, especially when I do a documentary, Raymond, it's not going to be exciting unless there's something there. Or it might be the best in the world. Because if I see something and I say this to everyone I talk to, I'm running to it. <laughs> might might be my demise, but I'm going to go get the, unless it's UFO, I, I can't fly clearly. But anything else I encounter, I'm going to run right to it. But yeah, what do you, th- what do you think they're, they're trying to get us? It's definitely, it, it seems like it's more leaning towards entertainment. I'm going to, the, the, there's, there's no one answer. And so I'm going to say it depends and then try to chunk through this because um, I think it's an important discussion. When I did the uh, ancient aliens, uh, you know, Giorgio Sukulis and Linda Moulton Howe and the Richard Dolans and David Hatcher Childress. And there's a couple others. They're the standards on the show. And then, you know, they're in almost every episode. Then they'll bring an expert like me in because, you know, it's, it's Wright Patterson. Right. So in that case, uh, you know, I wrote some things, I answered their questions and they wanted to get my unique take on Wright Pat and its history with uh, extraterrestrial material and testing it and the possibilities that bodies were taken there. And what I found with the ancient aliens group is that they wanted me to be uh, engaging so that, you know, the audience uh, would listen to what I say and it would be entertaining. But they were very much focused on me giving them facts and then you know talking sometimes off screen about the facts and then going back and doing another shoot to make sure that you know another go around to make sure that oh oh you didn't say that the first time we, we think that's you know so they i felt very very good about that then again i was on another show called expedition x which is sponsored by josh gates and i was on the premiere of expedition x and um, they were interested a little bit in Wright Pat, but they were kind of interested in their angle was, could the Mothman, which is only like, you know, I'm living in the Dayton area. So it's only about a two hour drive from here, right. uh, Point Pleasant. And so they were going to go off after they filmed here, they were going to go off and film there. And what they were trying to get me to do as a military expert, because I spent nearly 40 years at Wright Pat as a scientist, they wanted to get my take on the possibility that could the Mothman have been a military experiment in like jetpacks or gliders or, you know, a single person um, ultra light that went bad. And this Mothman thing, I don't think about it. A guy in an ultralight, uh, you know, buzzes some people that maybe have been drinking all night and they don't hear that little light motor, but they wanted to explore that. And so for weeks beforehand, uh, we went back and forth and I dug through military uh, stuff and I, you know, and uh, as being a guy who did field tests for the government, I 100% ruled out it could not have been a military flight test that went bad. But do you know that when they got here, they were, they tried every trick in the book to get me to say that there was a good possibility that this was just a military (laughs) experiment gone bad. I see that a lot on these shows. Our experts say yes. Well, who are these experts? (laughs) You know, why are they always off camera? Um, That's, that's, you know, that's not fair to you. And it's, it's really, again, irresponsible for them because- here you are, you have a wealth of information, you've done your work, you've done research, you're, you're out there speaking with other people in this network, and they're trying to corner you to say something, to put, and it would probably would later put you in a question. That's not fair to you, and they shouldn't do that. If, if you want, look, the Mothman's already an interesting subject by itself. To try to put a spin on it to make it seem like a government thing, I don't know. The more I read about the Mothman, I got my own theories on that, and it, and it bears no relevance to the military. <laughs> so I, yeah, I think that's not fair to you for you, the guests, especially you and the audience even more. Cause then what happens is people, they know Ray, they trust Ray 
And then he gets on the show and he says something like that. And then later on, the show itself gets called into question and it puts you into question. And then it could damage your career and your research. That's yeah, that's horseshit, man. Well, they act. What they did is they did a little snipping editing. Yeah. And when it played, it made it sound as if I said, "Well, you know, it it could have happened, you know." But but they snipped two things together to make it sound like I had said, "Well, yeah, there's a possibility." When I had told them for months there was no possibility. Well, when that thing played, my phone rings. It's my son. Oh boy. He goes, "Dad, Dad, you didn't say that, did you?" Because he, of course, he knew they would never say that. Because my son is also has uh, you know experience in that works for the gov, and I go, no, I didn't. They snipped it. Uh, you know, they did a Franken dub, and uh, all I can tell you is, you know, I apologize to you, but you know, I didn't say that. And you know, I just thought, well, I don't want to deal with these people in the future if that's the way they're going to work. Yeah, you know, it's on. Un- I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Raymond. What I do do to documentary. I assure, because mine's, it's, I'm, I'm not going to accept any big budget people to come in and, and finance it. I want it to be organic. I'm going to get a really high grade camera. I'm talking to Douglas Wilson from MUFON about what equipment to use. Um, and I'm building a network with people like you. I'm going to go out there and look. And it's not going to be a two week thing. I'm going to podcast on the road because I'm going to start traveling from the, from one point of the United States in the north across the, the other side and then back down through the south. It's going to take a year of change. This isn't going to be a small documentary. I could also promise it's not going to be a whole bunch of our experts believe this is true. You're never going to hear that. (laughs) That's never going to happen. And if it's not exciting, look, it might just be boring. But if I find something, you'll be entertained because I'm one of these weird people. I, I I will never, I won't sleep well ever again. If I'm in a field and say per se, a Bigfoot somewhere out there, someone caught a glimpse of it. I'm not good enough to sit still and try to zoom in. I'm running for that thing and it might cost me my life, but I'm going to document it. And that's, that's going to be my approach. Other, so I, I, I like, I like that. And so, you know, we've discussed like the, the TV folks uh, and, you know, we, maybe we just cover a couple more in a couple minutes here. Like researchers, what I found is a lot of the researchers start out high integrity and they want to know the truth then they get a little bit of the taste of, you know, now you're a public hero. Uh, you're talking at all the conferences. And instead of just saying, folks, that's all I got, they start to embellish things. Like there's a couple of, there's at least one extremely well-known writer, talker, um, who's, who's uh, co-writing uh, author actually disavowed him when he found that this particular individual won fabricated a witness and fabricated evidence. And I caught this same guy fabricating evidence that he put in a book. And I think the motivation is, you know, you're this, you've been given this big blossoming uh, career and, you know, you've written a book and now you got to keep upping the ante and and you got to be first with something. And in order to do that, you start to invent evidence and you start to invent witnesses and, I've seen that happen. And and I can tell you of at least three well-known authors whose books I read that I found errors in. And I mean, errors of fact that I could prove. And in each case, they tried to blow me off. Wow. Like I was the one who was making the mistake. And not a single one of them ever made an upgrade or a change to their book to correct the facts. You know, that's a shame too. You know, I I hope that I don't think I will. Uh, I'll say this because I've been in a lot of positions in life where, you know, I, I became a pretty important person in a lot of different positions. I just I never really cared about being there. This I, I it's not just you followed you with me. It's it's uh, the big question for me is the afterlife. What happens after here? And so it leads to the road of uh, Bigfoot and ghosts and you followed you because at the end of the day, it's me questioning my mortality and satisfying a curiosity at the same time. I wouldn't be pleased unless what I found was real. I would lose sleep. I lose sleep. Ray, I lose sleep over dumb shit. I, I listened to a documentary once about space and the universe. And when I learned what I learned in that documentary about how vast everything is and, and there's bubbles of universe, I didn't sleep that night. I was mortified. I was like, my God, I'm, I'm so small minded. I, I really thought I knew this and now it turns out it's that. So yeah, I don't think I'd be able to do that. 
I would have to really find facts. And if I don't look again, I'm telling people now that are listening, my documentary is going to be boring. It's going to be a lot of me looking and hoping I'm, and I'm never, and you know, I certainly don't want the, I'm not bashing this person. I don't know if you've seen this, this particular documentary, but this person who's sitting outside of a trailer in the middle of a desert said, oh, the Navy dropped off files to me. And I'm thinking, how the hell did you get on a documentary this large? <laughs> There's no way the Navy gave you files. There's not, it's not a shot. There's people out there like Lou Elizondo fighting for information. There's people like Ray Schmansky looking for information and you get the files. Stop it. You know? So yeah, to your point, I don't think I'll ever get to that point, but yeah, I can see what you mean. There's a lot of people do that. So I wonder how much, how often is that the case? You know, you really have to do your homework. People ask me all the time. Okay, Ray, you're in the community and who do you trust? And my, my blanket response is you have to do your own homework so that you become a smart buyer of information. Right. You, you have to have enough facts on hand. And then, you know, in our little um, pre-session here, uh, I said that one of the questions we might explore is what benefit would it be to somebody who has a deep interest in UFOs and extraterrestrials of going to a conference and how, how to approach that? Because right. once you read all those books and you've got a kind of a library of factoids in your head and then you go in and you listen to the speakers and and many will allow you to ask questions during the Q&A session or you know you can talk to them at their book table you can look at them in the eye and and get real-time feedback and over time you get a general sense of whose information you can trust or if you find something wrong with it you can go to them and go hey you know you said this happened in june of you know 2008 well i got a document here that says it happened in april of 2009 and the good guy is going to go holy crap you're right man I, i'm gonna you know put out a press release i made right. a mistake and then you'll find the other guys will go well let me see that oh oh i i didn't write that 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 was my co-author you know and then you call the co-author and they'll go Oh, no, that wasn't me. That was the guy you originally talked to. And so you get to learn who the sleaze is. Yeah. And you get you get to learn who the straight shooters are. So it's it's a long education. But every researcher makes mistakes. The honest ones will correct them. Those who are in it only for the money will not. Yeah. I mean, I listen, I expect to make a lot of mistakes. I I, I make mistakes, but that's part of learning. I just sent you an email. Tell me if you say if you got it yet. I do a lot of off podcast interviews, a lot, you know, to get people's perspectives. I speak to doctors and cops and just regular people who don't want to be in a show. They had a small experience. It's isolated, but I get to hear these stories. But I, I just emailed you a, a message I got from someone. And I'm going to tell you, I get a lot of this. I spend hours every day sifting through this, this type, these type of messages to try to get to those, that one nugget, that one piece of information. And then I run into some of these people and it's, it scares me. Like I had a guy straight tell me that uh, he thought I'd work for, I, I, blows me away. I, you work for the CIA. I'm like, what? A podcast. I'm, I'm relevantly new. Like, what? I can imagine they'd use better resources to get to someone like you. Right. So are you seeing that, that email yet? Yeah, I'm reading it. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Let's see. <laughs> what are raptoids, man? <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's. I think he's he's uh, combined a, a couple of things together. He he's combined the reptilians with the insectoids, and he called them a, a reptoid. Yeah, it's creepy. I love it. And so that uh, you got to understand that represents a small portion of what I come across. So again, when I go out and do the research, and I I have to, you know, the people on the podcast for the most part, I vet really well for the most part. I, I try to learn very little about them so I can make it like an organic thing where we're just sitting down and have a conversation. And then there's, you know how many podcasts I've canceled? A lot. In the middle. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> right in the middle. But we're done. Because <laughs> I just, what? I can't go political, yeah. then I can't hear bullshit, you know? <laughs> I, I, I only uh, dropped off once because uh, it was a Canadian guy. And first, you know, oh, I've got 800 million listeners across the way. And of course, you can check that stuff out. Right. And he didn't. But, you know, I went on the show. And then about halfway through, um, instead of letting me talk, because, you know, that's why I'm invited on the show right. to have the conversation, but give me a chance. 
he started talking about everything I believed in was BS and whatever. Oh my and God. I went, oh, my God, we're, we're, you're, you're, you're breaking <laughs> up. And then I just shut my computer off. Yeah, no, not me. I just told him, like, hey, man, I'm sorry. This is where we part ways. I'm like, why? I said, because like, what you're telling me is, is worthy of a movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> How much time do we have today? Whenever you want. I'm not, I don't, there's no one here on my, my shoulder. There's no producer. Usually I run about a, anywhere for an hour, an hour and a half. So we're free. Uh, okay. Well, you know, I, I uh, told you that I had some new information about swamp gas, my ass. Yeah. Yeah. You did say that. Let's hear it. I love to share it. So what I did is, is um, there's a guy by the name of Doug Marin. And uh, Doug is a, um, he writes for a newspaper called the Sun Times out of Dexter, Michigan. And it's just a small little, you know, community paper, but it's, it's out of the mainstream. And Lord knows that I sent marketing packages to many newspapers in my state, in Michigan, where the story took place, New York, not a single response from a newspaper to do a story on my book. So I find this guy had wrote uh, an article about uh, the Dexter incident and the swamp gas UFO, and we resonated. So he did a book review, very complimentary. And um, in that book review he put out, he said, Ray wants to know if there's anybody there who has personal stories they want to share from that time in the 60s with the Dexter UFO. So stories started to come in, and I want to read this one. Sure. And what happened is, is I went to Dexter uh, late September of last year to do a live talk, and it got canceled at the last minute because of COVID. So I wind up doing the broadcast from the library. And, um, you know, told uh, the audience that I was there. And a letter a couple of weeks later got sent to the library in my name and asked the library to forward it to me. So I'm going to read it to you. It says, Dear Mr. Szymanski, regarding your lecturing at the Dexter Library, 55-year-old UFO, I have this to tell you. We were longtime residents of Dexter before moving to Florida. In the 60s, living on Joy Road, about one mile outside of Dexter Village, I was driving into town and was at the intersection of Joy, Mast, and Huron River Road, about to cross the bridge. Now, I can tell you that the place that she was at that I just read to you is about 10 miles as the crow flies from the exact spot where the Dexter UFO landed in the marsh in 1966. So she literally was right where it happened. She says, I was about to cross the bridge and to my left in the sky was a show of lights, like a clamshell that opened and closed and then moved out of sight. I never said anything about it for years, thinking that no one would believe me. What I saw years later was a program on TV about UFOs and there was a lady who said she was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Again, Ann Arbor and Dexter are neighbors. She, she said she viewed the same thing. In closing, I am turning 92 this month and talks of UFOs are being renewed. Hope you have a good one on September 27th. Betty, and I won't say her last name, she gave her address and her phone number. I called her up and interviewed her, and it was fantastic. So a lot of these things are coming in, and there are so many different angles that, oh, and I'm also, I have, a, I have an invitation to go to Dexter this summer and do a couple talks. Huh. So I expect to get more of these stories, and when that's all said and done, probably next winter, after I've collated them and I've checked them and done all the things I need to do, I will update the book Swamp Gas My Ass, and I'll put a special section in there with all of this corroborating evidence. And I'll have you right back on the show. <laughs> oh, oh, it's fabulous. Oh, there's, there's stories people are telling me about uh, they were abducted in Dexter during this time period. And, you know, they're giving me access to their family. Uh, it's, it's 
it's mushrooming. This whole thing is mushroom. I have somebody who knows where the, the thing landed, um, you know, knew the, the, the people who lived there. They lived on the road. So it, all this new information is coming to light. Well, I mean, that, that's a good thing. I just had Kathleen Martin and, uh, and Earl Anderson or Gray Anderson on last night. We were talking about abduction and there's a lot of people in the world like, oh, that's bullshit. But if you really think about what we do in, in science, everything that's being done to us, we would absolutely do somewhere. If we, if Ray, if you and I were on a ship, we stumbled on a planet has intelligent life on it. It's a little more primitive. They're probably in their, their stone age or maybe even in uh, in their bronze age. And but we can't breathe their air. So we need representatives to go down there and study them. We would have these little robots because but if we're advanced enough to travel to planets, we're advanced enough to have a bipedal robot with scanners in the head. And then if we eventually want to go touch foot on the, on the planet, we would have to find some way to get their DNA to, to blend with ours. There, we would start science on these, these individuals where there would be a study, a long study. So to the credit of people that have been abducted, this isn't fantastic. It's, it's, it's exactly what we would do. In fact, we abduct all the time as humans. We abduct animals all the time and cut them open. How do they work? What's their DNA like? How do we breed these so they could be in our house with us, right? House pets. You know, not all dogs were cute. They all came from something very, you know, primal, you know, whether it be a wolf or, or a wild dog or, or, or a dingo. Point I make is we abduct things all the time for science. And now you scale up something that's more intelligent by great folds, considering what they do in, in, uh, in the air. Yeah, it's, it's a science thing and it's not impossible. It's not fantastic. It's very feasible. We do it. We just do it at a different scale. I mean, does that sound about right to you? My second book, uh, this is another shameless plug, which is Victoria's Secret Truth, is a two-year case study I undertook of a family that has had contact with entities. The grandmother, the oldest one in the book, um, since she was about four or five years old. And so I got a chance to talk with her at length. I think, you know, again, to your case study, I have, you know, 40 plus hours of interviews that we did recorded. I have the three hypnotic regressions that she did with, with it actually have four hypnotic regressions she did with four world-class regressionists. I got to talk to her grandson who took me through his experience experience at the site where it happened, literally from point A in his bedroom, down the steps into uh, the choo-choo room and, um, you know, explaining how they laid him on the table and everything that happened to him on this one particular evening. So um, there's no doubt in my mind that there's some kind of hybridization program going on and uh, we're part of it. Yeah. I mean, this is something we would do. I, I hate to stress that, but if we found another planet with life on it, we're going to figure out a way so we could utilize that planet, especially if we can't breathe the air. Yes, yeah, suits are good for a little while, but even better, how do we adapt to it? How do we evolve to become part of it? It's going to, we got to get the locals. We got to, we got to experiment. We got to cross DNA. We got a hybrid. That's just the way it's so, and it's, by the way, that's not something you do over the span of 10 years, generations, millennia for that to take, for that to be perfection. So if, if people want to call in the question, why are these abductions still happening? Because the experiment's not over. I don't care how advanced your, your technology is. It's going to take generations to get to the point where they could just be among us and breathe the air and, and, and be, not catch. Here's another example, too. Uh, how many people died when, when uh, Europe came over from disease? It wasn't like they just, you know, we didn't just kill them. We, they died from us because... Uh, Something we had is some sort of virus wiped them out. I mean, that's, I think that's speculated on the Mayans, what happened to them. But the point I make is imagine now uh, a, a more aggressive virus or bacteria from not from our world. And, and who's to say that, like, let's say, right, let's say we sneeze on a napkin and we throw it into Venus where the atmosphere is so dense, it gets crushing. But that virus goes there and be like Superman, it becomes like it, it thrives there at a greater rate, it becomes super strong. So what if some bacteria virus comes to our planet and because of our atmosphere, like Superman, becomes powerful and could uh, decimate us? There's a lot of things there. So when it comes to abduction and, and the agenda of aliens, 
people have this thing, it's, it's selfish. We, we think in the terms of our own lifespan, but that's not the case. Science does not happen in a lifespan. Life spans and then some before perfection of science, you know, and the experiment will continue. I, I think we make it easy for them to watch it us anyhow. Like we have everyone in their house has a camera and a, and a, and a microphone and some, whether it be your security system or your nanny cams, we made it easy. <laughs> we made it real easy for them to watch us, but the experiment must go on. So yeah, I agree. Hybridization makes prime sense to me. Ray, before we close, uh, is there anything you want to add? Uh, the only thing that I'd like to add is I'm extremely surprised at how many people I talk to who are unaware of the 25 June Office of the Director of National Intelligence nine-page report that said flying saucers are real. Yeah, and and and, and the way the way that I know this is um, what one of the things I, I do when I'm in Florida is I go to the Space Coast and I, I, I am a metal detectorist and I have a wonderful metal detector that's probably the best in the world for detecting things in the sand. And it's the Mind Lab Equinox 800. They're not paying me. I'm just telling you, it's the, it's the best value for a sand metal detector that you can buy it does of course all of it but anyway i go to the after i do my mcdill thing in your neighborhood i go over to the space coast and i i look for artifacts in the beach um to include pieces of space wreckage thing that have come off rockets that have blown up on the cape huh. and um while i'm out there detecting 10 people a day will come up just to have a conversation with me and ask me about, um, you know, what I'm doing, what I'm looking for. And I always try to steer the conversation into, they go, oh, what are you doing down here? And I tell them I'm doing research and whatever, and a retired senior scientist. And, uh, you know, I'm now a writer. And what do you write about? And, well, that's that's the death question, because now I'm going to fill their ears with, you know, my trilogy. Yeah. And I've got a pocket full of cards. And I'll tell you what, I do more marketing on the beach pretty much than anywhere else. And sure enough, then I looked on Amazon, I see my sales go up during those weeks. But then I get around to this, you know, they, how do you know that they're real? And I go, do, do you know about this report that came out in June of last year? Never heard a thing about it. Wow. I mean, it's almost <laughs> unanimous. So if I talk to, let's say, conservatively, I talked to three dozen people on the beach in the four weeks I was there. One person heard about it one you know that answers my question why there's people like nope they're not real it answers my question because it's either they're they're not paying attention or are, are just our our news outlets just did not do a great enough job conveying that message to the world it's crazy <laughs> that blows my mind i i don't know raymond i, I don't know i that bugs me that people are just so oblivious to what's going on around them more people know about what's going on in, in, in the world of COVID than anything like that. I mean, I, or in Ukraine, you know, what's or, going on in Ukraine. Yeah, that's Why don't you, why don't you get yourself, um, you know, you're in Florida, get yourself somebody from the Tampa times or the newspaper there, you know, the, the clear water consciousness or whatever they're calling it and get a, get a guy on and say, Hey, you know, I'd, I'd like some media guys to come on my show. We want to talk about this, this UFO thing, you know, and, and, you know, would you give it coverage? Why didn't you give it coverage? And then, you know, spring the 25 June report on them and see, see what they have to say about it. Get some insight there. Or, you know, maybe you just make phone calls and find out. But I think you having a show would give you a little bit of, you know, a honey to draw somebody in to have that kind of discussion. Agreed. Yeah, that's a good idea. Plus, I'm really aggressive. I hate no, so I'll harass them. <laughs> so that's a good idea, though. I or should... find somebody find somebody who might have published an article about that. You know, like if you find somebody wrote about it in the Tampa Times and it's a local guy and say, well, why did you write about it? I'm really interested. And why don't we see more? And then maybe, you know, you can tell me what you find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, because, you know, in, in Sweden, they, their news, they talk about UFOs in the news. 
it's part of their coverage. <laughs> so, I, when I first learned that, I was like shocked. I was like, what? Like that's well, they had the ghost rockets after World War II. Sweden had, and they have the famous lights that that they record all the time in the air. Yeah, look up the ghost rockets for for Sweden. And and there's an active a professor uh, does field trips every year with his students, and they go out and they film these things. Uh, the ghost rockets we're running down now. Yeah, yeah it's, part of it call, it's part part of their culture. I mean, that's, yeah. that's that's why I like talking to people like you, Raymond. It makes me find new things. I'm digging. I have to dig more. I love. Yep. I will always be a student. Even if I someday meet an alien, per se, I'm still going to be a student because even then I got to ask questions. You know, that's probably why an alien would never talk about <laughs> I say that a lot. It's probably why aliens and ghosts won't bother me, man, because they're like, this guy's a pest. will not leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Raymond, it's been a pleasure. We are definitely going to do this again. Uh, you're you're, you. you're going to be a, a figure on the show frequently. Uh, his Raymond's books are going to be in description. They're always listed there when I speak with him. And uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. It was it was great talking to you, and you know uh, we'll we'll make a, a regular appearance like this. And I can tell you that I have another project working. I'm going to be very sketchy about it, but I have another project which may come into fruition late this year. So uh, when when it's ready to near near launch, I'll let you know. Yeah, you got a platform here. You know that. That's it's an easy. Anytime you ever want to come on with something, you just let me know, Ray. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Indeed. Well, have a good night, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.